Hello and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. And for this week's episode, we have some interesting science conversations with the spokespeople of the PhD net. What do I mean by spokespeople? Of course, I mean the spokesperson and the deputy spokesperson of the year 2021, as well as the spokesperson of the year 2022. So let's jump straight into the science discussions. We're going to talk about what science they're doing and also talk a little bit about the PhD network that they do. So without any further ado, let's just jump straight in and have a discussion with Hank Liu, the spokesperson for 2022, as well as with Leah Heckman, the spokesperson for 2021, as well as Sarah Young, the deputy spokesperson for the year 2021. Okay, Hank, welcome to the Offspring Podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. And uh, you're the new spokesperson for the year 2022. So just, you know, just give us a brief introduction about yourself and tell us what do you work on? Thanks for having me, Srinath. So I'm working in the Max Planck Institute for Heart and Lung Research. Uh, I'm already at my fourth year now. Uh, my topic is about the epigenetic regulation of the heart development. Okay. I mean, that that's quite interesting, right? Like, so you're studying heart development as well, just as myself. We, we're, so for in case people didn't know, Hang is a colleague of mine, and he, we, we, we're both at the same institute, and we're recording this particular part of the podcast live in person because we're both vaccinated and we can be in the same room. So if you're not, please get vaccinated already. We're not trying to do any propaganda here, but it's important that everyone gets vaccinated. But anyway, besides the point, so heart research, heart development, and you said you study epigenetic modification. Yeah. So I think we had an episode before with Pooja where she discussed a little bit about the epigenetics, but can you maybe give a brief introduction to what epigenetics means? Okay, so the, the concept epigenetic comes from the Greek word epigenesis. And so it's basically a theory where in a development of biology, thinking that uh, our organs were originated from the one undifferentiated cells. And, um, but the epigenetic research is a kind of extended, um, extended meaning of that. Um, so basically in each of the cell, we have the same copy of DNA, but then how could those DNA convert to transcribe to RNA? and different um, copies of RNA and how those RNA, they, they can build up the protein structure and so yeah. that the cells could differentiate into different uh, functional organs. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a very interesting idea, right? Because just in case people are a bit unaware of the terms that Hung used, uh, just, just to simplify them a little bit. So the building block DNA is present in all cells yes. and it's the same DNA in all the cells. Yeah, exactly. But what RNA comes out of the DNA in each cell is different, or in each type of cell is different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I mean that that's 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 what makes it more interesting, right? So how does the cell know what genes to to transcribe? Is that's the biological term so to, to to transcribe into RNA, yeah. and what genes to not? Yeah. So, I mean, but that's a very fascinating question. So what exactly do you uh, try to understand when you, when you look at heart development and the epigenetics? Yeah, so there are actually many layers of uh, epigenetic regulation. So um, we can see that DNA are always not naked. So they are wrapped to the nucleosome, octoma, so that uh, it's called chromatin. Um, so we have the first layer, for example, DNA modification. Uh, for example, methylation, hydroxyl methylation. Yeah. Um, but then the second uh, layer would be uh, methyl uh, the modification on the histone, mm -hmm. uh, so that they could recruit different partners um, to to make the, for example, making the chromatin structure more open yeah. or more compact, and therefore um, influences the um, accessibility of the um, um, transcription. That, that, that's, that's quite fascinating. Yeah. So basically by these processes that you mentioned, like methylation, 
and the sort of chromatin, let's say, remodeling, yeah. right? It's you're able to open up certain regions and close certain other regions, yeah. so that so that that's basically how it it works, right? So, are you are you interested in specific genes which are regulating heart development, or or what 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 exactly? Would you do you do you like to, do you look at in your research? And so there's a protein called SUF four twenty two one. It's named so long because it was first uh, discovered in Drosophila. Oh. Um, but well, it, Drosophila scientists uh, <laughs> they have creative ways to name things, right? Like um, yeah, but it's uh, like it's, it's intuitive. Um, okay. So SUF four twenty two one so it methylates uh, the histone H four at the lysine twenty site, and it's one so that it. Com uh, methylate the the monomethylated uh, uh, it convert the monomethylated uh, lysine twenty into the dimethylated uh, and okay. some, uh, so the trimethylated. It, oh, so it's a, it's a single change. Uh, yes. Okay. But that's that's somehow it's and this theory is not tested yet, but um, I think it has something to play with. Uh, so the the genome structure. Okay. So, so we know that a genome is uh, is not uh, um, one dimensional, two dimensional. What it's actually yeah. three dimensional, and there's a, a mechanism of regulating the um, the compartment of the the chromatin. Yeah. Um, so that is, um, we have the hot uh, heterochromatin where yeah. it's more compact and where the genes are usually silenced. Yeah. Um, and um, quite a lot of them were attached to the uh, the nuclear peripheral. Okay. Um, so then they get silenced there, and mm, well, they make the space for the other, um, for the other, uh, chromatin, where they they can uh, more, um, diffu diffuse freely in the in the in the center of the cell space, and they can uh, recruit some transcriptional factors. Okay. I mean, uh, I am slightly confused, right? Like because. Uh, you you mentioned that the genome is three dimensional, so basically, it it's not just this linear DNA wrapped around the histones or the, the chromatin, but like different chromatins can interact with each other because of the way they're compacted. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm still slightly confused because when you when you mentioned uh, the 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 part where you have. Uh, like different types of methylation, and this is on the chromatin, which is how you have accessibility to your to your gene. Yeah, um, but actually, the the different part of the, the so meth some methylation could uh, make the um, chromatin less compact. Okay, but majority of them makes them more compact. The more compact. So, so we have also on the opposite the acetylation, for example, would yeah. make it more loose. Okay, so I mean, so this so and this is a very small process. Which is happening, or you know, to to look at it in the scale of things, right? It's a small process happening within a small cell, which is regulating what the cell becomes, yeah. right? So, what what is the broader question that you're looking at when you study heart development? Um, so, um, yeah, I like this question. Um, first, when we have the ES cells, where it, it, like it has different, uh, it has all the possibility to differentiate. So, let me uh, the, the embryonic state uh, where it's not. It, so the embryonic stem cell, so, exactly. they are able to go into different cell types. Exactly. Yeah. So at the time, they don't have much compact chromatin because okay. they have to make sure that you have uh, you can go into different directions. Yeah. Um, but um, there's a stage where it get uh, when it start to differentiate, then it start to acquire expression of some um, progen uh, markers, mm -hmm. and it's kind of um, to a. Uh, um, prone and to differentiate into different um, type of cells. And once they're differentiated, and then they have to make sure a certain group of genes have to be silenced. Mm. Otherwise, um, the cells might have a problem and they might not, uh, for example, differentiate into cardiomyocytes very properly, okay. and that um, could cause a problem in the heart. So, so, so the so basically, you want cells to gain the specificity. To become cardiomyocytes, which are like the heart muscle cells, exactly, which would so so that they can perform the proper function, and if the genes which are needed to be activated and the genes which are needed to be suppressed are not done in a timely manner, yeah, we would end up not getting this specifically functional type of cell. I mean, this is this is really fascinating. I mean, uh, you said you're in your fourth year, 
So is this like a project that you came up with or how did how did how did the idea for this project come around? Um so it was first we um in our lab we first find out that um some mutations uh, on the uh, on this protein is correlated with um congenital heart disease. Oh okay. And we we want to see whether we can encapsulate this in mouse. Okay. That's basically how we started the, the project. Okay. I mean, that's quite fun. And you said the gene was identified in Drosophila. Yeah. And then it, it so it's, it's sort of conserved among different species. Yeah. And you're able to identify this in the... In, so, and you said humans have yeah. this disease. Yeah. So humans with mutations in this gene have this disease. Yeah. I mean, this, this is really, really interesting. I, and I really hope we could... Uh, you know, find an interesting answer to the question that you're asking, right? Yeah. So if you want to frame your question into a single statement, how would you say it? That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say, um, so cell development is a very exquisite program and how this program coded our whole developmental process um, finally into heart. And that's what I uh, want to answer the most. But it's a very, very fascinating question. I really like that. And maybe to end this uh, short part of a science talk, if you would like to talk about your research to your grandma, how would you, how would you explain your research to her? Oh, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I think I would tell her about um, how the same copy of DNA could go to... Uh, different copy, different copies of RNA, and that decides about the fate of our cells. And therefore, we have um, thousands, ten thousands of um, different type of cells in our body. Um, that's basically what I tell her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 a it's a thinker, right? Like we need to really try to think how we could explain our work in the simplest of ways because I'm sure if I tell my grandma DNA she'd be like oh my god what is that right yes. so I mean maybe I could try to simplify it if you if you if you don't mind yeah. so maybe yes. I would say the cookbook of our of our cells has so many recipes right yeah but we don't want to make all we don't want all cells to make all the recipes at all times we yeah. want each single part to be able to make one specific thing, right? Yeah. And the cookbook is our genome. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, the recipes are the DNA. Mm -hmm. And whatever comes out of the DNA is probably, let's say, our RNA. And uh, and then the, the, the cake or whatever is made is mm -hmm. probably going to be our proteins, which give the function to a cell. But anyway, That's a great summary, thank you. Yeah, so all right. <laughs> anyway, this, is, this has been really fun talking to you about your work. Hang, I hope you. you have a wonderful year as spokesperson of PTN. So the reason we're doing this series is to show the scientists behind the political figure that they are as PhDNet representatives. So I really hope people understand that we do PhD network on top of our science, yeah. not, a, not in replacement of it. So... And I'm, I'm sure this only makes us more efficient and more conservative in the way we spend our time and the way we spend our personal resources. So I so really appreciate you taking the time out today to do this and to join us on the podcast. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thanks a lot for joining me. Thanks, Serena. And one last uh, word. I hope that uh, more of our excellent doctoral researchers could come to join PhDNet. Um, it's really great experience uh, um, it's a really great experience for me, and I hope uh, that will do the same for you. I completely agree. I completely agree. Thanks a lot. Thanks. All right. So that was the discussion with Han. And right now, we're coming into the second part with our discussion with Leah Heckman, who was the spokesperson for the year 2021. Let's jump straight in. Hi, Leah. Welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. And just give a quick introduction to who you are, what your current role is, as well as what your science is. Come on. Hi. Um, so I'm Leah Heckman. 
and uh, my current role is that um, I'm speaking a lot. So I'm the spokesperson of the Max Planck PhD Net for 2021. So almost at the end, um, very exciting year. Uh, and then, of course, uh, on top of this, I'm doing my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Physics. Uh, I'm researching the most energetic sources in our universe. So I'm trying to unravel the complex behavior of especially our two closest blazers that we see um, for two telescopes that I work with placed on La Palma. Whoa, whoa, okay, okay. Go back. Okay, now Too much. I'm, 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 already, I'm already hooked. I'm really hooked on okay. what you're saying. Okay, you said you're working with energy sources or like the two most energetic sources? Two of the most energetic sources. So, um, so blazers... Uh, can you explain what you mean? What yes. these are? Uh, so, Basically, what I work with are two telescopes that measure gamma radiation, so the highest energies in our magnetic spectrum, electromagnetic okay. spectrum. Um, and I don't see stars with it, or I don't care about that I see stars or something. Okay. Uh, what I care about is the most massive and most energetic objects in the universe. And um, these could be a lot of things like pulsars or other things. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm concentrating on are galaxies that have a supermassive black hole in the middle. Oh. So if you um, know about 10 to the power of five, it's at least 10 to the power of five times our mass of the sun. So that's almost a million times the mass of our sun uh -huh. um, or even more. Yeah. Um, and what happens is that you have like very turbulent regions around it. So like it's a lot of magnetic fields, it's a lot of particles, it's a lot of plasma. Yeah. Um, and sometimes this leads to like jets of particles being accelerated towards us on Earth. Okay. Um, and that's what I try to observe. And there are wow. two of these sources close yeah. to us, um, which close, makes it even you mean easy. By, I mean, of course, close doesn't mean <laughs> the same yes. for you and me, right? I mean, <laughs> no, what, what uh, distance are we talking about here? How many light years? Uh, so I actually don't know the light years. I could look okay. him up, um, but I know a nice um, timing for you as a biologist. So yeah. the light that's sent out by the sources, um, when it was sent out on Earth, there was the first complex life uh, in water. Wow. So, oh, wow. so like basically I'm doing history. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course, like that's how, that's how astronomy works, right? Astronomy yeah. is basically history, but we're just getting to know the history now. We're living through the history of astronomy. Anyway, going back to the the first part of what we were talking, you said you're using telescopes in La Palma? Yep. You get to visit them? Yes, uh, this is actually really nice. Um, On the travel form, do you also check that you take a vacation before or after? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we have to actually go there. So once a year, we have to go on shift as a duty to our collaboration, okay. um, which, of course, is like... A huge sacrifice, especially during Corona. Um, I spent two months on La Palma this February and March, um, did two shifts, and in the middle had two weeks of vacation on the Canary Islands when everyone was in lockdown here. Um, but A of course, it's sacrifice. also yes, <laughs> <laughs> and also I mean it's just nice to be there on top of the mountain somewhere in Dover, like having an amazing sky of the stars and everything. Wow, I mean that sounds really fascinating. I mean, I think physics in general, when you get involved in physics, right, it, it can be really, really interesting. But tell me a little bit more about what exactly you do. So what do you study when you study these energy sources? You said these are basically galaxies with supermassive black holes inside them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, with the recent discovery or like recent imaging of mm -hmm. the black holes, probably it was really exciting yes. for you, right? Actually, I mean... The image was taken from a, like, a similar galaxy, just turned 90 degrees compared to the ones that I'm looking at. Uh -huh. And also uh, this year, like EHD also took data of my galaxy. So maybe okay. uh, in a few years, I will have a picture of my galaxy. Let's see. <laughs> okay. But um, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, tell us more about these, these energy sources. Uh, it's really mm -hmm. fascinating. So basically what I see is I don't really see the black hole or the surrounding mm -hmm. because what I see is this jet of particle that points towards me yeah. and this is brighter than everything else. So like I want to try to understand what's happening inside these beams of particles. What is 
radiating? Um, is it electrons? Is it protons? Is there something else? How does the environment look like? Are there different regions or is it one big one? How is the magnetic field? Mm -hmm. So I try to learn about the environment that's in this chat and mm -hmm. Other people that, like, for example, look at the one with the picture that's 90 degrees um, shifted yeah. can look at other regions and maybe together we can, like, find a big picture of what's happening at these kind of sources. Wow. I mean, that's that's really, really fascinating. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of, I, should, I have to admit this, I'm a bit of an astronomy nerd myself. <laughs> and uh, I just find it so fascinating when major sort of, objects like this in the universe are studied right so uh, just tell tell me a little bit more so when you have so w one thing which really comes to mind to me is that like when you have to observe from earth's standpoint we're really looking at something which is in our plane right like it's 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 something is being ejected in this plane so how do you measure the particles uh based on like this this i mean are you able to extrapolate with some other sort of information about what the energy source is like or how do you measure these so yes so it's the thing is what's done nowadays and this is what's the most fascinating for me it's the era of multi-messenger astronomy so it's not just us um, looking at it in gamma radiation um, and it's also like I'm not just using the gamma rays um, for my work, but we are collecting all of the other different wavelengths, starting from radio, which is also, for example, taking the pictures, then having optical telescopes on Earth, having uh, X-ray satellites in space. Um, and then on top of this, uh, like there's also neutrinos. So this is our particles that go through everything. So they're really hard to measure, which makes them really nice messengers because everything else that's charged uh, can't make their way to us. Only light can make their way to us. The rest is observed or deflected. Um, neutrinos also make their way through us, but they also make their way through us to the other side and go away. Um, but there's actually some detectors that can now measure them and give us upper limits at least on wow. what we would like detect. And all of this information together, we try to combine to a big picture. Wow. I mean, so I, this this is one of, like, you know, uh, one of a, like like a very easy start uh, to a science fiction sort <laughs> of uh, story, right? I mean, it's like you can always talk about neutrinos. I mean, like they can pass through so many like you know charged <laughs> gas clouds and everything, right? I mean, one thing which I'm a bit curious about is like you said, you measure gamma rays. Uh, does uh, and also we know that like black holes are really heavy and they mm -hmm. they really warp the gravitational sphere around them quite a bit right like so my my big question is like when you measure these uh sort of uh different parameters uh how do you uh, sort of accommodate the like some some i mean i don't know it's a very noob question okay i'm i'm just asking <laughs> from the top of my head okay? mm -hmm. so don't judge me i'm just asking because do you see somehow that like different gravitational effects from different bodies along the way can somehow alter the way you detect it? So, Yes. So for example, for my object, I don't see that. But for similar objects, what you often see is gravitational lensing. Yeah. So um, that, That's the word I was looking for. Yes. <laughs> so you can have a massive uh, object in the way of the light. Uh, and then the light doesn't take the direct path, but it's actually deflected. So as I said, my objects are close. So like also there's not that much in the way that's very massive, So which is nice for me. But with others, it happens that you, instead of a point, you see, for example, a ring, or you see four yeah. points, depending on how like the gravitational field deflects light. Yeah. I mean, this is this is really fascinating. And uh, I, 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 I kind of want to ask you to summarize basically what you've been talking to me about your, your mm -hmm. work and your research into maybe one sentence can you can you put this in a sentence and tell me uh how would you for example state it say this is my work in one mm -hmm. sentence it can be yeah. a long sentence that's fine i use long <laughs> sentences all the time okay so I, in german i do in english i try not to uh, okay um let me try so um using our gamma ray um, telescopes on La Palma and all of the other multi-messenger information that we have nowadays, I try to 
uh, make sense of the complex structures around our closest, most energetic sources and especially blazers. Okay. That was not a long sentence. But I'm going to ask you to... Okay, you used a lot of terms when you mentioned this. Mm -hmm. But now I'm going to ask you to really simplify this. Mm -hmm. And imagine... I'm your grandmother, and you're trying to explain this to your grandmother. So how would you sentence. explain this? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't have to be one sentence. You can use 10 sentences. But just mm -hmm. imagine I am your grandmother, and you want to explain your research to your grandmother. How would you do mm -hmm. that? Um, so basically what I look at are galaxies. And as you know, also our galaxy in the middle has a very massive black hole. Um, and like... Luckily for us, this one is inactive and doesn't do anything, so we are all fine. But at some other galaxies further away, like actually they are active and are swallowing matter around. And this leads to beams of uh, particles and light being like accelerated towards us on Earth. Um, and this then produces radiation, but also radiation up to the highest energies, which is what um, I'm trying to observe with the telescopes that we have on La Palma. Okay, but Better? As, a, as, as your grandma, I'm very confused by what galaxies are, what radiation is. Oh, galaxy, come on. Uh, but I radiation, mean, yes. Uh, yeah, radiation, <laughs> yeah, okay. galaxy. I, I'm lost. I mean, yeah, okay. as a grandma, I'm like, oh, big words. But I don't know <laughs> what you said. Can okay. you try to explain it a bit better? Yes. Can you use an analogy maybe yeah. to explain this? So, I mean, what you see in the sky is like a lot of stars. If the sky is clear and it's dark, you see a lot of scar stars. Um, and all of these stars together um, form hubs of stars, which we can call a galaxy. Um, and because we have uh, gravitation as a force that like attracts mass, so like the mass is attracted to the most inner part as much as possible. Uh, and this is why uh, often there's a big uh, bunch of mass hidden in the middle of the galaxy. Um, and this then can lead to very turbulent and energetic things happening uh, at these um, galaxies, and um, which is what I try to observe. So like, I, like this turbulent and massive environments produce light that I can observe, light up to the highest energies. Um, and this I want to try to use to understand what is happening there. Yeah. Just to uh, maybe, I, I will try to simplify it as a layman, mm -hmm. if, yes. if it's okay with you. Yes, so I'm please. trying to think of it. If I tell my grandma, I'd say, imagine if a car crash happens, you hear the sound, you, you see people screaming, mm -hmm. right? And the sound can, you can hear the, the, the hitting, the sound, the, all of this over very long distances because mm -hmm. it's a very loud sound, right? So mm -hmm. I would say maybe that it, this is what you're looking at, but through, a, like, this is not sound, but it's some energy which happens from different objects doing it's different It's like a flash. Things. It's like a flash. But it's yeah. at, at a very, very long distance away from us. And it's... It's like it's a permanent flash. Us. Yeah. <laughs> it's happening so far away. We're yes. trying to look it and understand what it means. But anyway, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an absolute pleasure talking to you about this. And you've <laughs> been a very good sport. I, I, I didn't mean to put you in the spot like that, but it's been, a, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot for joining it's us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, now to the third and final part of today's episode. And it's going to be with Sarah Young, who was the deputy spokesperson for the year 2021. And let's jump straight into the discussion with her and see about her science. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. So perhaps as a quick brief to the listeners, perhaps you can introduce yourself, your position, and also the science that you're working on. Yeah, thanks again for having me. Actually, again, it's my second time on this podcast and uh, I'm really excited to be invited again. I am a, a PhD researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Colloids and Interfaces, but I am actually also, and I think even a slightly bit more importantly, at the moment, the deputy spokesperson of the PhD net. And uh, this has been keeping me very busy in the last year, next to doing a lot of super interesting science. 
I mean, again, I think I mentioned this previously, but the reason we're doing this series is to show the scientist behind the administrative role that you're pers- I mean, not administrative, but more like the, the voluntary role that you're doing, right? I mean, of course, for us as PhDs, the science is what's most important. Or at least we try to keep it that way. So let's jump straight into the science. Can you tell us a bit about what you're working? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, I have to say that I really, really love my science because um, I'm working in the cancer field, which I feel is something uh, very relatable for many people. So um, more specifically, I'm actually working on uh, breast cancer bone metastasis. So we look at uh, what happens when someone has a breast cancer and then some years later, um, they present with a metastasis in the bone, which is actually um, mostly uh, lethal. So bone metastasis is something that cannot be healed easily, rarely ever. Um, And so I feel like putting a tiny piece into this really, really big picture of bone metastasis is something that at the end of the day in many, many years might actually really help a person. And this makes me feel like I'm doing like research that feels relevant to me. I completely agree. I mean, this field of cancer biology is really a really uh, like, like a field which is very close to most people because I'm sure like the statistics although they make for very bad reading, there are a lot of people with cancer in the world and cancer is so common that uh, we really need to pay a lot of attention to the biology behind it and how, for example, by metastasis, you mean it, how the way it spreads, right? So you you, you spoke about breast cancer bone metastasis. So it's basically breast cancer spreading to the bone. So like, can you explain a bit more about this, this process? So actually, we are not really looking at the process itself, but rather what happens once the cancer cells have really arrived to the bone. So okay. um, I am I am a bit of a hybrid. So from my studies, I started with chemistry and then I moved into biochemistry, but now I'm actually rather working in biophysics, I would say. So we actually not so much look at uh, how the cells really are able to arrive to the bone but what we specifically look at is what happens when they are in the bone and not necessarily what do the cells do but actually how does the bone at this itself reacts and in mm-hmm. the most of my phd i actually focused very much on the mineralized bone so maybe to explain this a bit Um, people often think that bone is this like very hard kind of dead tissue but bone is actually an incredible like organs very much alive so you have the mineralized tissue which has a protein uh, mostly collagen and then it uh, basically um, has hydroxyapatite which is uh, the mineral that's why it's so super hard Um, and this you can um, see with methods like uh, micro ct Mm -hmm. And then in the middle, you have the bone marrow, which is a completely different uh, tissue way, like it's a completely different way, more soft tissue. And we are mostly focusing (laughs) and we are mostly focusing currently on uh, the mineralized tissue. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm just sorry, I'm just a bit confused. You you mean on the mineralized tissue or demineralized tissue? Because they sound quite similar to me. (laughs) (laughs) On the mineralized tissue. Okay, okay. Actually, this is very interesting. It's cool that you're bringing this up because since bone is mineralized, for most researchers, it's really not a great tool to work, like not a great organ to work with because it's super hard, it's difficult Mm -hmm. to cut, it's difficult to image, it's just difficult, like period. So what is very, very often done is actually that people um, basically just pour a lot of EDTA on it, which is a chemical that binds uh, the calcium and then you demineralize it and you basically get a very wobbly bone. But for me, you're losing all the interesting part. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, uh, one interesting thing that you mentioned, which which I find like somehow quite fascinating because you mentioned micro CT, like this is this is computed tomography imaging right and this you said you said micro so again this is something very uh, interesting for me can you explain this the, the way you do this and what micro ct is all about sure um so at micro ct you actually use x-rays to basically um 
look at an object that is um, well, has a high electron density, so something with higher elements. So for example, you can see calcium, but you cannot see the organic tissue. Like you cannot see the bone marrow, but you can see the calcified bone. And um, you basically create with a lot of math and stuff that I can really not explain a 3D image. And the fancy thing about micro CT is that we can go really deep down to like very um, high resolution. So we can go to the micrometer scale. And if we use, for example, um, muscles um, that also have a shell, right? You can just put them in the micro CT and go really down to like even sometimes the nanometer scale. So wow. it's a really impressive tool, but um, I mean, not micro CT, but CT is also used actually in humans. So all kind of living organs. So it's also um, part of basically every type of research that we're interested in. That's, that's very interesting to hear. I, uh, another thing that you actually mentioned a bit, I mean, like a while ago was that you were talking about the bone itself and you mentioned collagens. I'm an ECM researcher. So, I mean, for me, anything related to the matrix, I'm immediately excited, right? So do you do you do something with the ECM of the bone? Because it has a very specific type of ECM composition, right? Like, I mean, because you said you try to study how the bone reacts when there's a when when it when it starts to metastasize or when when a metastatic cancer yeah. cell comes to it. So I mean I'm sure there's something to do with ECM that's happening over there, right? So actually this is something that we want to do for my PhD. We're not quite there yet. I mean what what I do really is really focus on this mineralized tissue and not go down to the collagen level yet. But um what we can see is that if cancer cells arrive in a certain number in the bone, I like cannot know the number because I don't know where the cancer cells are. But we see that very fast for some um, samples, we actually see a osteolytic lesion developing. This is a very complicated word. But what it basically means is that when, when we scan the sample with CT, where we only see the mineralized tissue, we see like a kind of a hole forming. Of course, there's no hole. It's all filled with like organic tissue, most probably cancer tissue. Mm -hmm. um, but it's scaringly impressive how fast this goes um, and how destructive it is. And um, now that we actually can basically quantify this process, so we use special tools to quantify how fast this is happening and where it's happening. Um, now we want to really look at the, the bones themselves um, with other many different techniques like confocal imaging and um, histological sections. And like there's a ton of things yeah. that you can do. And to okay. find out what's actually happening on the organic scale. And collagen could be one part of this. So in confocal imaging, there's uh, there's many ways to actually look at collagen. Definitely. I mean, especially something like multi-photon imaging, right? Where you'll be able to sort of use uh, two photons and try to excite uh, different parts. I, again, yeah. I don't want to get too distracted, but this is very exciting for me because I'm an ECM researcher, like I mentioned before. No, anyway. I totally agree. I mean, two photon collagen type one, definitely yeah. a thing. And then we can get into the bait of which collagens you can see. And yeah, which definitely. Like ones. fibrillar matrix, interstitial matrix. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's not get sidetracked here. I, I, I'm getting too excited about this. <laughs> okay. Going back to Sarah's work. One more thing that I really want to ask you. And uh, this is something which I find because cancer, again, we mentioned cancer so close to like to humans and so like so translational, so to say. So what do you see is the potential impact of your work for, you know, let's say in the next five years or 10 years? And how do you see this sort of developing at least the field as far as uh, your specific research is concerned? That's a tough question. So I feel like I will go a bit back to answer this question. I hope that's okay. I feel like when we say cancer, we actually talk about a million different diseases and people just see this as kind of one thing, but in reality, it's just, it's a, it's something that we find, which is like a mass of cells that gets very destructive, but actually the, the reasons, the way it develops is, is always different. And, and so, I think that, you know, when people ask me, do you think we will be able to heal cancer? I'm like, 
maybe we'll be able to heal a few cancers, but it's not, there's not the cancer. So I think this is important to set ground for my answer. I am in this field that I would say is like biophysics and um, what has been neglected for a very long time is actually that physics plays, plays a huge role also on the cellular level. Like physics is everywhere also in our body. And I feel like this field has become very important and has become more attention. And it's finally at the stage where it's actually connecting to biochemistry. So we're connecting um, gene upregulation to stiffness, for example. And I think being part of this development will massively help us getting closer to solving some problems related to cancer. I hope that wasn't too specific. Uh, no, no, but I mean, th this was this is a very, very fascinating answer. I completely agree. See, I I'm an engineer by training. And I switched to biology because I found, like, I mean, also the, one of the major things that I that I did when I moved to biology was to under, try to understand the fluid dynamics of blood flow. So for me, like biophysics and, and, and the molecular mechanisms which are being linked to the physics of the system and the organism, that, that, that is really fascinating as well. So I completely understand that merging these fields in, in, a, in a meaningful way is definitely going to bring new insight into what the field can develop in the future and how we can actually go ahead and understand. Because of course, as you mentioned, cancer is not one thing. It's it's a, it's like it's like a blanket term, like saying sport. There yeah. like a million sports, like a million cancers that can happen, and a million types of ways in which it can develop. So, I, I I'm I'm very curious to what comes out in the field and how at least we can take steps closer towards battling this really really crazy disease. Anyway. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thanks a lot for joining us. And thanks for explaining your science in such a beautiful way to the audience. And I'm sure everyone enjoyed listening to what Sarah's working on. And also, in case you missed it, Sarah, as a part of PhDNet, also spoke to the Bundestag. Can you maybe give a brief brief introduction or like an explanation of how that experience was and what it was about? Yeah, actually, I mean, it has been a very exciting, very political year for me. Um, but in the start of the year, we were invited by, um, yeah, the Bundestag. So the, um, they have different groups for different uh, fields. And so for uh, education, they also have one group. And uh, they invited us as um, experts to, um, to basically comment on um, what we have been working in the last year so uh, we were asked about uh, power abuse and we had to give a very long statement also which also can be found um, uh, about actually two proposals from the F fdp one was about um yeah, you should read about it but it was all about phd research and how actually to make the the, the scientific system better Anyway, this this is really fascinating as well. And it's so great that you're able to balance your science as well as your involvement with the PhD Net. And this is actually an encouragement for all PhDs who are listening to this podcast. Please make sure to involve yourself in the PhD Net because your voice is important. And that is how we're able to get the large amounts of statistical data that we can actually use to make the lives of PhD researchers better across the Max Planck Society. And I'd like to thank you again for your like fantastic talk now, as well as thank you again for your fantastic explanation of your uh, science, as well as the work that you do for PhD. Thanks a lot for this. Thanks a lot for joining. Thanks a lot for having me. It was really great to be back. And I can only recommend to everyone to get involved because it has really helped me crazy and in my phd it has kept me going when i really didn't want to continue anymore so i think oh. it's a driver <laughs> i completely agree it's a driver it doesn't encumber people or maybe it does but you'll find a way around it yes. anyway thanks a lot for joining us sarah and thanks to you the listener for listening so long if you still are if not why aren't you anyway and that basically brings us to the end of today's episode and I hope you enjoyed it. We took a short dive into the science of the PhDNet spokespeople, as well as a short dive into what interests us, especially when it comes to our research. I hope you enjoyed it. 
And anyway, we're shaping up towards the end of the season for the podcasts. We really hope you've enjoyed this. We'll have one more episode coming out very soon with all the hosts and all the new people who are joining us. For stay tuned for that. And until then, stay safe, stay healthy. It's a bye from me. Bye bye. Officer Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD and the Science Communication Working Group known as the Officer Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Shana Trump Kumar and the pre intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you'd like to give us any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. See you next week. Stay safe, stay healthy. Until then, bye bye.